What's going on, Packer fans? Welcome back to the Pack a Day podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. Joining me is the one and only Mike Wall. You can follow him on Twitter at Mike Wall68. Mike, so glad to be joined with you once again. We are finally coming off a Packers victory. Packers Bears Sunday night football. Packers pick up the win. I want to start. Well, first of all, how are you doing? But second, what were your overarching thoughts from that win on Sunday? Andy, I'm doing great. Thank you very much for asking. Uh, it's always good to get a win. And it's always good to get a division win. We need to get off the schneid, obviously, after that that really bleak week one loss in Minnesota. Um, you come off this winning and just go, man, Aaron Jones is really special. Um, and we have some – I think we have some pieces that you can kind of see fitting together over the course of the of – the, or hopefully the early season as far as the offense goes. Sammy Watkins showing up was was big. Randall Cobb made a couple plays – Cobb made a couple plays in there. Um, but it, it wasn't – it wasn't a pretty win on offense, even though we did, you know, we have 27 points to show for it. And defense is kind of the same thing. Like to score 10 points, uh, you have to go, oh, oh, what a great game. And then you look at your opponent, you look at the fact they ran for like a buck 80 on us. And even though Justin Fields only ran or only threw the ball 11 times, so he probably dropped back. What's that make? He dropped back probably 14. Yeah. Then, then you go, oh, well, of course they ran for 180, but I remember watching the game going, did they forget like in the second quarter that they could run the ball? You know, it was just one, it was kind of a, the whole game was kind of weird. It was, it was definitely, um, it's definitely one to build on, but there's still a lot of improvement to be made if we want to go up against top teams, both the NFC, but of course the AFC. It is amazing that you say that because that my whole that was my whole thought as well because I thought like I, I mentioned um, earlier this week when I did the film review I'm like I think this was kind of like a B minus ish game for the offense and the defense maybe even like a C C plus yeah um, I, I felt like this was very indicative of a very inferior opponent um, that just didn't have the talents on offense or on defense I thought they were I mean David Montgomery was phenomenal in this game I thought he ran incredibly well uh, made some Packers defenders certainly look silly at times uh, but I also mentioned I didn't I don't necessarily know that that's uh, the worst thing in the world they they did not come out great uh, against Minnesota uh, in their first game I thought they made steady improvements from week one to week two something that they can build off of um, and I think it's going to hopefully be that story through the course of the year where they get a little bit better week by week but um, in some ways I'm kind of buoyed by the fact that all right, they picked up a 27 to 10 win division game, Sunday night football, um, and they didn't even play that good. And I know it's a bad Bears team, but uh, I did think that this was a, like you said, it's sort of an okay performance. Yeah, I've always liked David Montgomery to start off with. I think he's a phenomenal player and he's been there. He's just, you know, he's just going to have one of those careers if he's on the Bears where you, you have a good player that's on the Bears, you won't ever, you won't ever hear about him. Um, so the true. devil, the devil's in the details, especially on defense. And you can see plays, we talked about it on our show, TJ Slayton turning a double team into a single block and defeating the block and, and getting penetration line of scrimmage. Kenny Clark playing at a high level and, you know, maybe either turning it into a single block or keeping both defenders off the linebacker. So like a, a divider Campbell can make a play, but you also see those plays where you talked about the missed tackles. There's a lot of ankle biting going on in the secondary. And that was a, that was like an area of concern that people certainly that Amon and I have been talking about for months last year on our show, as far as, one of the main concerns last year going into this offseason, and are we going to improve in the in the tackling department, being consistent in the alleys? We're, we're not there yet. Um, you see Quay Walker is getting a lot of playing time, and certainly there's no question in his athleticism, and he's only going to get better. But right now you can run right at Quay Walker whenever you want. He doesn't take on blocks from guards very well. Um, and I – I don't expect him to. He's a rookie. I mean, I didn't expect Nick Barnett to when he came in the league either. He became a phenomenal player. Quay's going to be a phenomenal player. But right now, if you're going to put him in there, expect the team's going to run right at him and expect him to get beat. And he might make the tackle, but it's going to be 8, 12 yards deep. And if people want to say that's a good job because he's learning, great. But, I mean, let's call it what it is on, on shows like this and be objective. Like, th those are some deficiencies that we're going to have to work through. No, I totally agree. So let me ask you this. When you um, obviously were playing and you were going against a secondary that you felt wasn't a good tackling secondary, maybe didn't want to get super involved, what did that do for your psyche as an offense? Is that something that you would game plan for and be like, all right, we're running right at these defensive backs that don't want to get in there and tackle? Or how, how does that change the game offensively for you? You know, it's it's interesting because we had Amon and then we had Najee. Um, I had Deshaun Foster and, and I had you know, guys like Steve Smith in Carolina. And those guys really don't, res unless you're playing like Brian Dawkins, you really don't respect the secondary anyways. 
Sure. Like we didn't really we didn't really respect the court the quarterbacks like we you try to scheme as many play like the play like the kick play in football is one of the oldest and most utilized plays to this day because it basically says my defensive back at the line of scrimmage can't can't tackle your your running back for less than five yard gain. And guys just keep running, they've been running it for years. They'll just they'll find new ways to run it because most cornerbacks not named Richard Sherman can't tackle very well or not not willing tacklers. There's guys out there that are. Um, certainly Jalen Ramsey comes to mind as a guy who's not afraid to do it in all levels of the game, but most of those guys aren't willing to tackle safeties are coming from when you're coming from depth. And we saw it in the, in the Chicago game in the alley twice missing on the screen and then missing on the outside toss to Aaron Jones, young players. Oh, it doesn't matter, man. If you're coming downhill hard and that, and that uh, running back makes a one, a one cut, unless you're learning how to break down, you're taking the time in practice to learn the proper techniques you're going to miss a lot of tackles and flat out i've been in i've been on the coaching side of it most defensive back coaches don't even want to teach technique they want to go right to scheme because they think schemes is wins, wins the game except for really smart coaches like bill belichick who says his number one priority on defense is to learn how to tackle yeah, no, that makes sense. And uh, I love that uh, idea that you basically are going into that game, not respecting the defensive backs uh, ability to tackle. Have you have you noticed um, and maybe not? Have you noticed a uh, I guess a, a degradation in the tackling from the Packers secondary specifically? I'm going to say from guys like Darnell Savage and Jair Alexander. I thought when Jair Alexander came in early in his career, he was very aggressive. Mm -hmm. And I feel like you still see signs of that from time to time uh, but there are also times there was specifically one play in the Viking game where he had an opportunity to kind of get his nose dirty a little bit and he completely backed up and is yep. like ah, I'm, I think I'm good on that one um, which is just something you didn't see from him early in his career um, Darnell Savage I've been mentioning this week there was the play with David Montgomery where Montgomery comes right up the field and Savage has the opportunity to make a play and Savage doesn't get a finger on him he completely uh, jukes Savage out um, I feel like those guys in particular were maybe a little bit more aggressive earlier in their careers and maybe haven't been as much lately. Maybe I put too much value on it earlier, but um, those two in particular, I've seen maybe a little bit less from in, in that capacity. There's there's certainly the idea that as you get older, you don't want to hit as hard in practice and in games. I'm not going to put that on either of those guys. Right. I'll say this from my observations just from this year. I think with with Alexander, you have a want to problem. And with Savage going back to last year and seeing this year because Savage missed a, a tackle in the game and then turned around, ran down the player, at, you know, albeit 10 yards later. But he did put in the effort to go make the, the tackle later on. So I think you have a want to and a can't right now, right? So you re the want to has to be kind of internally, do I want to do this? Am I, gonna, or am I making business decisions or am I making legacy decisions? Right. And, the, the can't is let's teach this guy how to be a better alley tackler, a better tackle in space, how to break down, how to not have your feet as wide, your feet are underneath you so you can actually you know step into contact. Those are things that Savage just isn't naturally very good at, um, but I see the want to there. I don't necessarily – I'm not saying the other guys shine away from contact. I don't say that about NFL players, but it doesn't look necessarily like he's all in for tackling right now. Yeah, and and to Jair's defense, he's coming off of a shoulder injury that cost him that basically the season a year ago. So there can be a little bit more hesitation when you've gone through something like that and maybe not wanting to be out. And Andy, those those guys know, man. They're not getting like Deion Sanders said it a long time. He's like, I'm not getting paid to tackle. Yeah, you know, and and, and that sucks from a teammate standpoint, and that sucks from a fan standpoint. But you also you the business side of it, you you got to go. Yeah, you're you're not wrong. Yeah, I mean, no. he made he made the play at the end of the game, and everyone's saying, "Oh, what a great play!" What and it was, it was a great play, but it doesn't negate the three tackles he missed in the game. No, totally agreed, and that's definitely something that uh, you'd like to see a little bit different. I want I want to go back to Darnell Savage for a second because I, I sort of um, mentioned this yesterday. I thought Savage's best season was in 2020 in the in the COVID season, um, and it seemed like Joe Barry in that, or excuse me, uh, Mike Patton in that season used him a little bit more in a robber role, used him a little bit more closer to the line of scrimmage, let him play a little bit more instinctual football, kind of go and make plays. And it seemed like he reacted well to that. It very much seems like Joe Barry and this defense wants to keep those two safeties high. It's obviously what's most in vogue in the NFL right now yeah. is keeping those guys high and making sure that you're not allowing big plays. 
Um, and then obviously if there is a run, you've got to aggressively come up and make that play, um, get in the alley, make the tackle. It doesn't seem that last year or so far the early returns this year have maybe made it seem that Savage plays that quite as well as maybe what he was doing at the end of Petten's reign in Green Bay. Um, have you noticed anything different from him or do you just think that, you know, uh, maybe it's like you said, technique that he has to improve? Well, I think scheme makes a lot of these players, right? I think you, I think you excel in, in certain schemes over others. And, and the easiest example, and I know he just got hurt, but Jamal Adams, everyone thinks is the cat's pajamas got a huge contract, got, you know, the yep. Seattle deal and everything. But if you really watch Jamal Adams, like he doesn't, he's not a good cover guy. And he never has been. He plays close to the line of scrimmage. He's he's an eighth defender in the box, and he does an incredible job of playing on the other team's line of scrimmage. He plays. He hits like a linebacker. He does all these things that are that are wonderful in that context. But if you take him out and put him in a shell defense, it's tough. And we just talked about it with with Savage and with other guys on this team, and and certainly with Chicago. When you're coming from 12 yards, from 15 yards deep, and you have to make alley tackles, if you don't have a natural predilection to tackling and you don't have really, really, or you don't have really, really good technique as far as your eyes, how you break down, all of that. If you're not spending a lot of time becoming the best at the basics, you're going to struggle because the ask is actually much harder. If I ask you to take a 15 yard run at me and I can go whichever direction I want coming right at you, it's going to be a lot harder for you to tackle me than if you're close to the line of scrimmage and I don't have any momentum. No, that's totally fair. Um, you had mentioned earlier uh, about Aaron Jones and how special he was in this game and how special of a player he is. Uh, you got to play with a running back that was pretty darn special, and you get to podcast him with him still. Uh, and that's obviously Amon Green, uh, just one of the absolute all-time great Packer running backs. Uh, a, as an offensive lineman, when you have a player like that, how does it change your mentality or approach to go about it, knowing that maybe if you get that block, that that player is going to be able to do something special with it? And B, what are sort of some of the differences and similarities between Amon and Aaron Jones that maybe make those two such great players? I'll start by saying I don't think we ever change our, you know, up front, you have some things you want to get done in your own life as far as the the, the kind of pain you want to inflict on other people in that when you have the opportunity <laughs> okay. to run the ball and, and the pride that you take in doing that, regardless of who's behind you, there is a sense of, when, a, when there's an Amon Green, when there's a Najee, when there's a Deshaun Foster, when those guys are in the backfield and you know they, they've got wheels, you know, like, man, all we got to do is get into that secondary because of what we talked about before, right? They, the secondary is not really willing participants in the con, in the contact game for the most part. Yep. Um, Aaron Jones is a phenomenal player. Uh, I just – you know what I love about Aaron Jones is he runs so angry and then you look at him, you're like, dude, you can't be more than 185, 190. Like, he, he can't be that big. I think they got him listed like 200, 205. Like, I don't buy no it. Yeah, but he just runs so angry. He contorts his body in ways. He just throws himself into contact. He runs hard. If they said it on the game. Roquan Smith said it uh, in the pre, uh, pre-game interview that although AJ's 250 and he's 205, like they said – he runs angrier. He runs harder. And that's not a diss on AJ. That's that's a real compliment to Aaron. When I when I look at Amon, even though Amon was probably 205, 215, he just played. He could deliver contact in a way that was like a 225, 230 pound back. He was faster than in his 40 time, and his 40 time was fast. I think he keeps telling me he ran like a 417, which I, you know, okay, that's pretty fast. But even if he was running a 43 or 4, I mean, he played the game at a really, really high speed. And once he made that cut, that one cut play, we just knew that he had a chance to go the distance. What I love about both these guys, here's the thing I respect the most about Amon. I don't know that Aaron does this every time, but he seems like the same kind of guy. The reason that we loved Amon more than anything is because I never saw Amon Green step out of bounds. No, it makes a ton of sense when you have a player that's finishing plays like that. As you mentioned, right, that that wears down the secondary as well. Those guys don't want a ton of contact. And if you're cutting back and in, in, into the corner, into the safety, um, rather than just going out of bounds, uh, it, it definitely adds up through the course of the game. I, I think both of those guys just run so incredibly hard, and that's what makes them so special. I mentioned it earlier this week as well, but, like, there's, there's nothing that you look at Aaron Jones, you kind of just mentioned it too, but, like, He's not the biggest. He's not the fastest. He's not necessarily the strongest. He's not the anyest. He, he might be the slipperiest. Like he's yes. he's extremely slippery um, to try to get your hands on. 
But man, the way that he runs, his his contact balance and his his balance um, through guys trying to drag him to the ground is unbelievable. Um, but he just finds ways. Great vision, great power, great speed. Like it's it's all great. But like just his ability to make plays, I, I'm I'm in awe of what he can do. Because again, you look at him, you're like, yeah, it's just kind of like a guy. But it is anything but when he gets the ball in his hands. Yeah, for sure. Aaron's one of those guys that. And you see these guys sometimes when you're, you know, high school and whatnot, not at that's at the same level, but guys that are actively accelerating into every part of contact, right? And when you talk about balance, balance in large part is if I'm always initiating contact on you, whether that's just because I give you a slight like body faint and then I strike into you, or whether that's I'm running full speed and just I have you glance off a little bit, but how you come in and out of those little cuts how you initiate contact and always the guy being on the front foot that really, I think improves his natural kind of body awareness, body positioning and balance. But you're right, man. He, he's just, he really is a treat to watch. And you know, it's, it's always one of those things after a game like that, you're like, gosh, why don't we do that more the last game? And it doesn't ever work out like that, but I know. You know, he, he, he can be one of those head scratchers for sure. I said the same thing because uh, after the first game when he only got eight touches and that was the big talking point, I'm like, I was more of the one of like, yeah, but sometimes it's just going to happen. The ball doesn't go your way. Sometimes you got to get Dylan involved and you were down in the game. So you got to throw the ball a little bit more. And then week two comes and I'm like, man, how do you only give him the ball eight times in a game? And it's just like, he's got to be the focal point of the offense. Um, I wanted to ask you too, because you mentioned the Roquan Smith point about how hard he runs. I think there's this idea, and I just I want to know your your total uh, thoughts on this. But I think there's this idea that because AJ Dillon is this bigger, more you know, just brutal looking, punishing running back, mm -hmm. um, that in a goal line to go or like a fourth and short, that he's the best option because he can move the pile. In my opinion, um, I actually like Jones better in those scenarios because a he's still powerful, but b um, he has a little bit less size to actually slip through some of those creases that get insanely smaller in those situations. And he actually gets to those that that point quicker um, than Dylan, who kind of sometimes takes a little bit more time to, to get in that momentum and ramp up, um, where all of a sudden that hole, that, that slight crease that was open is now closed by 11 guys closing in on that spot. So personally, I actually like Jones a little bit better in those goal to go situations, but um, I'm literally just curious your thoughts on that. Um, I, I'll say this. I think AJ was a victim of them planning the game around Aaron Jones this week. Uh, you, when you look at, and I always say, I, I love AJ the best when AJ is running to space, not to contact. Sure. Right? When he, when he just puts his head down and, and goes to where the space is and isn't kind of looking for that first contact and then putting his head down and going, like, I always think he's a much more effective back. You see it in some of the runs this week. And you also see in some of the runs this week where, you know, there was a great play where, where Myers actually had um, number 90 on the Bears, a defensive tackle, reached. But A.J. just doesn't want to, f like, kind of play that out all the way to the C-gap and the way they were running. He, he cuts it back, 90 makes the play, and all of a sudden Myers looks bad. Yep. And it's just one of those things where that's not necessarily his cup of tea. Now, he, he's good at a lot of things. And contrary to a lot of people's popular belief, like, you can interchange the looks and the – and the um, and the assignments that you give AJ and Aaron, I think almost you know, 90, 95% of the stuff, but there are things that are just AJ is going to be better at. And there are things that Aaron's going to be better at. If you're going to go down and, you know, I think the other thing you have to look at with that, Andy is and tell me what you think, but if your offensive line isn't really good at creating movement downhill, then naturally you're probably going to want to find the edge or want to find somebody a little slipperier who can make people miss. Sure. If you feel like you can get a good double and it's going to be literally like Roquan Smith on one of the two, me personally, I'm probably going to take AJ because I, I think AJ is good for a yard there. But if you got a guy who's, you, you got like a double, what we've seen a couple that we saw in the Minnesota game a ton where, you know, they're all of a sudden Royce Newman single blocked on their best D tackle and you got somebody that has to slip by. I'm definitely taking Aaron Jones. Yeah, that's a really great point. Um, I'm just happy they have both of them and have both of those options because they're both incredible running backs. Um, obviously, one of the big pieces of news from this game and, and prior to the game was the return of Elton Jenkins, him getting the start at right tackle. Um, I didn't think this was necessarily his best game, but I agree with Matt LaFleur and Aaron Rodgers that this was a very successful game for him. Uh, he had only played 33 snaps in the NFL at right tackle prior to that game, and he's coming off an ACL injury. And to play, uh, as you know, 
how he did in that game coming off an ACL and coming off only playing 33 NFL snaps at right tackle prior to that game. I thought there was a ton to build off of. And you could also just see, at least in my opinion, um, that there was a lot more confidence on offense with him on the offensive line, being able to move Royce into right guard, et cetera. But what were your thoughts on his return? Yeah, he looked like he hadn't played in a while and he looked like he hadn't played that position. Um, he, and, he, and he also, you know, you can kind of tell the way the way he moves and the way he handles situations that he's a really, really good player. Uh, I would, I would agree that I, I don't think he's going to go put that that clip up or you know the series of clips up in that game and say that was one of the better games he's ever played. It was great to get him in there. I think, I think the compound effect that it has when you get to move Royce. In, first of all, Royce isn't playing right tackle anymore, which I think is a huge win. Yep. And then I think Royce is better than than Hanson at right yep. guard. So I think that's a huge win as well. And so I think just by, you know, those the kind of addition there, you're going to have a better right side of the line. Um, you can see that, you know, LG, the thing that is when you watch Elgin, when you say, okay, what does it mean? He hasn't played that position. Why does it matter? He flat sets a lot. And, and he, you know, he sets out at a 45 a lot. So what does that mean? That means that the TE games are wide open. They're basically open for business whenever you want them because Royce isn't the kind of player that can shove a guy an extra yard across his face. And it also means that if you have a quick player on the edge, he's going to get that corner really, really early. And now it becomes a question of whether or not Aaron can step up or get out of the way or throw the ball in time because he's going to get beat on the edge a handful of times if he continues to set that flat. He doesn't do that over on the other side of the ball because he's just more comfortable with the stance. It's just everything's about the what you get in your stance and the way you get out of your stance. And right now you can tell he's just got to rep that a little bit more. But kid's got incredible balance. He's already been, you know, a Pro Bowl player. So the, the ceiling's really, really high in him. There's a couple of really good right tackles in the league right now um, that he's going to have to chase if he wants to kind of be in that conversation. But, you know, he's certainly a great player. Yeah, he is. And I think, you know, it's just going to be, I think, week by week, him getting more comfortable in that spot and just making the offensive line that much better. Um, I thought another player who returned this week uh, at, at left guard coming off the concussion from a week ago, we talked about it last week where I uh, didn't necessarily, I don't think, played up to his expectations in, in the Minnesota game. Uh, I thought John Runyon Jr. was a lot better in this game against Chicago. And I think I had him as my highest graded offensive lineman this week. But um, what were your thoughts on his return coming off the concussion from a week ago? Yeah, I definitely agree with uh, your sentiment. He he played extremely well. Uh, it was a great bounce back week. Uh, if he wasn't, I don't you know I I didn't grade the players, but he certainly looked like the the best one out there to me. Um, and I thought I thought that for uh, large parts of the season last year too. I, I think he's a I think he's a really solid player. Um, that with improvement, a little bit of improvement technically, and then just continuing to develop his body. I think can turn into a guy that's considered a top 10 player in the league. I think he just has that kind of ceiling. Um, I I just really like that, that he doesn't get penalized a lot. I really like that he's, he's good with his hands. Um, I, I like that him and Myers have already kind of figured out how to work well together. And they, the job of communication mm -hmm. and rising to the second level is, is more often than not very efficient and effective. Uh, and the thing I'd love to see from that side of the line now is a little more physicality with the kind of the extra shots, push, you know, getting people on the ground, pushing over piles, taking shots on the defensive end when he comes inside. I think those little components of the game are really going to kind of add to his his legend and legacy in the, in the league and get him some more attention because he is, I think he's on the track to becoming a really top player. I really do too. I think he has the ability to be a really good left guard for the Packers for a very long time. I'm really excited to continue to watch his trajectory. There's some differing opinions on uh, Josh Myers this week. What did you think of his game? I don't think it was very well. Okay. <laughs> so when you first watch it, you like when you're watching the game, you see him in the backfield a lot and his guy making a play. And then you realize that the, the guy was always coming from Royce Newman's over Royce Newman. And it was, and I'm not saying it's Royce Newman's fault, but what I am saying is you have to communicate because the center, let's say that you're doing a zone play to the right. If, if this, if the right guard doesn't communicate that the center should come with him, then more often than not, he's just going to go right to the linebacker. And if you do communicate that now the center will take different footwork. He'll open up his footwork a little bit so he can get a little more depth or more width. So he can take on that three technique who's maybe spiking underneath uh, the right guard. Now, at least, at least three times I remember that didn't happen. And all of a sudden, you know, you see a center in the backfield one, two, three times. It starts, it, it immediately turns from a good game with bad plays to a bad game with good plays. And then you couple that with 
the the snap incident, which I don't know. I don't know about what you what you heard on TV, but it looked like he timed up the snap count pretty well. But maybe that was like supposed to be on two or a dummy count or an ice cream or something. Uh, Rogers in the post game presser said it was supposed to be on two, and and Josh okay. snapped it on one. He, yeah, he, that makes he, sense. Rogers called it a brain fart. Was what yeah. He, well, see, yeah. So with that, that kind of stuff, and listen, the smartest guys I know, are, you know, Frankie and and Mike Flanagan. Everybody has those once in a while, um, but it was just maybe maybe last night. You know, it was just like JRJ the night, week before. Maybe it wasn't his week. Got it. Uh, I, I thought there were some good things in this game, but there were a couple plays like that too that you're just like, I would uh, like with Myers. I just want to see a bit more consistency because you see some of the really good plays that he's capable of. Um, I just don't think you see it through the course of the full game yet. And I think yeah. if you can get, I think if you can get that, um, they all have a really nice center on their hands. Long. He's term. got the burden of expectations too, right, Andy? Like we way. expect him to be really good. Like we expect him to be Corey Lindsley. I mean, I I do. I'll just I've I've said it many times. I think he's the second coming to court. I think he's like you know Corey two point oh. And he's got the same pedigree. He's got the same body type. And, and you just look at him and think, like, he could be an all-pro guy. And, and you forget, man, he's in his second year, you know, and he's and he's doing pretty well. But the bar is set really high for him. Well, that, and I was talking to Aaron Nagler about this earlier this week, but, like, as spoiled as Green Bay has been with uh, Brett Favre and Aaron Rodgers for three decades, I'm not saying the centers have exactly been to that level. But outside of, like, a Jeff Saturday bizarro hiccup for, like, a year, um, you're going, like, what, Frank Winters? Um, Mike, Mike, Mike Flanagan, Scott Wells, JC Treader, Corey Lindsley. Um, like that is a very impressive run of centers for the Green Bay Packers. Um, That's a yeah. really good point. Yeah. yeah. The, what's the best part about that? That Saturday's Saturday was the uh, Pro Bowler the same oh, year he got benched by uh, Corey. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah, Corey. Yeah. It's like the that is that. So, like, amongst offensive linemen uh, back then, before it was like based on Twitter votes, that when we all saw that, we were like, or actually, it might have been based on Twitter votes, but we're you know we were all like, and now you understand why we don't care about these things. <laughs> it was like the ultimate, um, like if you want to know, how, like yeah, just Pro Bowl voting in a nutshell. Yeah. Uh, Jeff Saturday making it as a Pro Bowler when he was benched by the team and played a, just a really bad season for the Packers that year is basically like the ultimate, like yeah, these don't matter at all. He was, uh, but hey, Jeff Jeff Saturday in the, with the Colts, unbelievable player. Absolutely. I'll give you a funny um, real real quick, and I'll give you a funny one. So so we play the Colts in, in Carolina. We have Chris Jenkins, you know, Chris is and Chris is my guy, right? But he goes, We're out there and Peyton Manning's out there, he's beating the brakes off us. And uh Chris comes to the sideline, he goes, he goes, They've been talking all week like Jeff Saturday is no good. <laughs> and like his coach has been like trying to bad mouth him. And Chris finally, like during the middle of the game, he's like, What do you want me to do? The guy's really good, like he, and he's six feet tall. He's 300 pounds. He bench presses 500. Like Chris just went off on the sideline. Like this guy is really good. You guys need to stop acting like he's garbage. Like he is <laughs> unbelievable. He's already a full time pro bowler. You know what I mean? But anyway, sorry about that. But no, that's really funny actually. Yeah, no, in his prime, he was legit, legit. Like in him and Peyton Manning, the uh, the IQ between those two and what they were able to accomplish at the line of scrimmage, that was a, a fun duo to watch, which I think in, in a way is why it was disappointing. I know he was at the back end of his career at that point, but just disappointing that it didn't work quite as well in Green Bay. But Enough Jeff, Jeff Saturday talk for one day. Um, what are your thoughts? We'll, we'll kind of do some uh, quick hitters here for the rest, but what were your thoughts on Preston Smith, Rashawn Gary, and just sort of their start to the season so far? Obviously, they're both integral players to the Packers' success on the defensive side of the ball. And, and you mentioned the, the Bears only dropped back like 14-ish you know, -ish times you know, in the entire game, but uh, thoughts on those two from this week? I just am, I'm continuing to think that Rashawn Gary is going to be a game plan guy. Um, I just – he he needs to turn more into a Cam Wake idea of Reggie White idea of I'm going to come at you the same way every time with the same move, speed to power, hands inside, and I'm going to work off that. And every time I do that, I'm going to then play off of whatever whatever your you you how you combat me. And I and as soon as he decides to stop going upfield and stop trying to get around the edge and make the splash plays, I think he's going to he be even more productive. I think he's going to average at least a sack a game. He's that type of player. He's a game plan player. Preston, I'll be honest, and I know Preston's numbers are really good right now. Preston got pushed around a little bit by tight ends and fullbacks in the running game. And, pro, and both of Preston's sacks were kind of a result of other people's works or, or, or other people's mistakes. I know that Preston's got some great pass rush in him. Um, I don't know that we've seen his best yet. And I think maybe as a consequence of Jonathan Garvin being not a suitable number two, he's maybe has to play too many snaps and, and he's tired in the run game. I'm not sure, but he doesn't look 
as dominant in the run game as I thought he did it this time last year. Interesting. I'll have to keep a little bit of a closer eye on that because, uh, yeah, I, I, th I thought to your point, you know, his pressures came when like the whole line was collapsing. And, and I think the one he was able to kind of, I can't remember if it was Minnesota or Chicago, but swing all the way around uh, as the quarterback was taking off. I did like the play the, and the, the one sack was unblocked, of course, but um, it was when uh, Fields tried to do the, the play action fake and um, he just you still got to make the play. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Very much so. So, no, I think. Uh, I think Preston, you know, uh, like you said, some work to do. Gary will be much but We talked about it last week. Once Gary just converts the speed to power and realizes he's a power rusher and isn't a you know speed rusher on the end, um, I think it's going to improve his game a little bit as well. But I think both of them overall off to solid starts and hopefully a, a base to improve upon as the season goes along. Um, speaking of improvement, I feel like the special teams has been vastly improved so far through the course of the first two games. Nothing game breaking, nothing game changing, but... 20-yard uh, return from Amari Rogers here. You know, Rudy Ford and Keyshawn Nixon and Dallin Levitt right in the kick returner, punt returner's face there. Like, you just see things that we didn't see consistently a season ago. Yeah, attention to detail. Uh, attention to detail matters. Uh, expectations matter. And I think when you, change the, when you change the narrative in that room, you change kind of the culture in that particular room, it makes a huge difference. Uh, we talked about it last year that when you have – one of your three branches of your team be that inefficient or that inept, then it kind of speaks to maybe a larger problem within the building. And I think bringing in a guy like they did, Rich Versace, as far as being a special teams coordinator, is not only kind of a structurally um, vast improvement from what they had, but I think from a cultural standpoint, and I know he yells a lot, and I know there's a kind of lot to be made of all that stuff, but I think culturally there's a vast – uptick in the team culture and chemistry because you bring in leaders like that that have high expectations for their players. I feel like they, in a way, like they kind of needed a, a coach like that, that maybe yells a little bit like, listen, Matt LaFleur will get on a guy if he screws something up. He's not afraid to do it. Um, but for the most part, I feel like he's a little bit more of a player's coach, player-led team, and he's going to let them kind of do their things. Um, Joe Barry, definitely same thing. He'll get after a guy if he needs to. He'll, he'll definitely bring an energy and an intensity to practice. Um, but I feel like having that, that third coordinator um, really be a little bit more aggressive, a little bit more yelling, a little bit more attention to detail oriented. Like, I feel like that's not a bad thing overall for this team. And clearly, Basaccia has head coaching uh, a little bit pedigree from last season as well with what he did with the Raiders. I just think that was a good hire overall for this team. Yeah, no question. And if you're going to have that guy on your team, well, look, now with the with the age of head coaches and these coordinators, you know, it's like your, your quarterback, there's a handful of guys on your team that are probably your, in your, you know, probably in the same high school class. And so it's it's the dynamic is difficult. And then you add all the money that the players are making now. And I know the coaches are making a lot as well, but it's like it's a very difficult dynamic. If you're going to have a guy that is going to be guy the old crotchety, this is the way we do it kind of deal, what better place to have him than the special teams coordinator? Because a lot of those guys are kind of the mid-level, lower level pay grade guys that are just, you know, the worker bees that or worker ants that are really going to have to fight every single day to earn their position on this team over and over and over again. And I think that's a really good way to lay a foundation for a wonderful culture. Could not agree more. I love that hire. And so far it's paying dividends. Um, quick look ahead to Packers bucks. What are you looking forward to this weekend? And what do you think green Bay needs to do to really have a successful outcome? Uh, I think it's going to be an interesting game because of all the injuries on the buck side, honestly, uh, you know, Aaron's done. Aaron hasn't had a lot of success. I think he's had like eight picks in the last four games or something down there is one in three. Uh, we just don't move. The, they have a great defense. I mean, they have a wonderful defense. Now, Akeem Hicks, who we know well from Chicago, is going to be out because of like plantar fasciitis. And I can't tell you that that is a huge deal because Akeem Hicks is a huge problem for our, especially on the right side with Royce. Like that is a bad matchup for us. And that allows them to play three down lines at, at, at some points. And like, you know, when they're running their five, their three, four, their five, two, however you want to look at it, like they can split those guys out much like we do because they know that a guy like Akeem Hicks can take, can take two gaps. So I think that's a big deal. Um, I think all of the injuries, it'll be interesting because Tampa's kind of got the defense that we think Green Bay should have. Yeah. Now, I know we run a different system. Like, they, you know, Todd Bowles brings the pressure. Those two linebackers inside are like PhD students. You know, I mean, they're unbelievable. Uh, Devin White and um, Levante. Levante, David. David. Yeah, they're, they're amazing. Their back end is all super confident. They play fast, ball hawks. They do get caught staring in the backfield a little bit. We'll see what Aaron's able to do with that. They're, they're not afraid to take some risks. But it'll be interesting to see 
our running backs against their their uh their their linebackers and their their run game. It'll be interesting to see if we can kind of take away their DB pressure and some of the and some of the looks they bring up when they when they do double A gap their uh, their linebackers or bring four off the side. It'll be interesting to see if we can just kind of have answers for that right off the bat, or it's going to be one of those long days. And then on the other end, their offensive line is terrible. But I, let me rephrase that: their offensive line is actually very well coached. They're just missing some players. Donovan Smith's a huge loss, but Josh Wells came in and played well. And unfortunately, he he He's just out. like tore his calf or something like that. So now they're on their third string guy, who's like a, a right guard. Ryan Jensen. Ryan Jensen gives you extra yards with the way he plays. They're yep. like he's he's good for like twenty five hidden rushing yards a game, and for him to be out, you can see that it's been a problem already. But their right side, bringing in Shaq Mason, who was a Skarnecki guy up in, with the Patriots, like he knows that kid knows how to play football. And then Tristan Wirfs might be the rest, the best right tackle in the league right now. So like, if I'm just gonna watch one matchup all week, it's gonna be Rashawn Gary versus Tristan Wirfs because I think that's a just super enormous matchup for us. And I think it's a good measuring stick to see where he's at. Yeah, it's a it's a fun matchup. Uh, even if you like, yeah, obviously everyone here is a, a Packer fan that's watching this. But like, one of those matchups where if like you didn't have anything else to like watch or cheer for in this game, like just watch Tristan Wirfs versus Rashawn Gary, yeah. that would be price, uh, worth the price of admission alone. I think. You know, we talked about earlier the running game. I think the running game on both these sides. I know it's going to be billed as Rodgers versus Brady, but um, I think if Aaron Jones and AJ Dillon can get going and make it so that their linebackers and their defensive line has to do a lot more heavy lifting in the run game rather than, like you said, be aggressive and um, blitzing up the middle and, and giving Rodgers a bunch of problems, I think that's going to change the dynamic big time for Green Bay. And on the flip side, we, we talked about it all day. You know, Quay Walker holding up at the point of attack, these defensive backs being aggressive tackling. Well, they got Leonard Fournette to face this week. And he's not yeah. a fun player to have to tackle if you are a secondary player that already doesn't like tackling that much. So I think just the running game in this game, Fournette, Jones, Dylan, I think that's going to go a long way in deciding this game. It'll be super interesting. And, and you see, when you watch Tampa Bay, it's almost like right now because of the injuries, they're not really sure what they're good at, but they sure have a lot of different plays and a lot of different looks. And they have, they, you know, they have a true fullback. And one thing that you saw last week with Chicago and, and something that gave us trouble is we're being attacked now by personnel and formation. And so what a lot of teams are trying to do is, is keep us in like a 3-4 look, walk out Preston and walk out Rashawn Gary away from the line of scrimmage and just kind of attack that. Or they try to keep those guys wide and they'll check it with a, a tight end and a fullback knowing that, hey, our defensive backs aren't doing a great job of tackling. I'm sure Tampa Bay is looking at that and looking at it like we can send our tight end at Preston Smith and we can send our fullback to chip off Preston. We All we need to do is get to the second level because we, we like our matchup four net versus fill in the blank. Um, so it'd be interesting to see if those guys step up and make plays. And like you said, on the other side, we did the same thing. Are, are we going to be an outside zone team, an inside zone team, or are we going to be like where we cut the herd and pull a bunch of guys? Last week with Aaron Jones, when you start pulling centers, guards, and tackles around the end, just imagine as a defensive player, there's like two bowling balls coming at you. It doesn't matter if you can block or not. Like you still have to get out of the way. You have to navigate around them and try to find Aaron Jones. And that, I think, is kind of a formula for success right now until we find defensive backs that are willing to come up. And with the new rules, they can't cut. So willing to come up and kind of create that pile right at the line of scrimmage so Aaron doesn't have anywhere to run. Totally agreed. I think it's going to be a really fun matchup. Uh, final thoughts, prediction for the game, anything you want to plug on the way out? Well, I'll tell you, I think the spread went down from 2.5 to 1.5 and, and still in favor of Tampa. This is going to be – you know, listen, I don't like to bet against the Packers. I think this is going to be a really tough game. Uh, it's going to be fun to watch, certainly, but I think it's going to be a really tough game. It'll be interesting to see who comes back off of their uh, their injury list. I think maybe that that might decide the game right there. And uh, yeah, I, I I'm looking to for there's a lot of good games this weekend. This is one of them, but hopefully the Packers can pull it out. It's been a tough place to play. We'll have to see what happens. I agree with you. I think this is going to be a very tough game. I I'm almost uh, like put the injury list to the side. Uh, this is going to be a very tough game for Green Bay to win, go down in Tampa. They're the number one scoring defense for a reason. I know Hicks being out uh, is going to be, you know, very, very big for them, but man, that defense is full of speed. They're very aggressive and the Packers offense, not, not the exactly a well-oiled machine at this point. So I still think that's going to be a very difficult challenge. Mike, tell us where we can follow you on Twitter. Tell us about the uh, podcast with Amon Green and anything else you're working on. Yeah, you can follow me at MikeWell68 on Twitter, process to perform on Instagram, and, and Ahmad and I do the On My Block podcast. You can find that anywhere you get your podcast. We talk Packers, we talk NFL, and we end up usually talking about, uh, we make some societal statements in general that, that probably go on for a little bit too long, but we're having a great time doing it. 
So uh, yeah, check that out if you can. We usually come out. Uh, we actually come out after every game or the Monday after every game. And then we also do a preview show coming out Thursday nights. Mike, I appreciate you as always. Love this every single Friday. Uh, make sure to follow Mike on Twitter at MikeWall68. You can follow the podcast at Packaday Podcast. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. Thanks so much for joining us today. Always appreciate it. Mike will be back here next Friday. I, of course, will be right back here tomorrow. But until next time, and as always, go Pack Go.